Tend to be where the light and darkness meet On the edge of the horizon through the trees I am a narcissist crippled with self-doubt I've got a courage that brings me to my knees I am equal parts Hello, hi, howdy. How's everybody doing today? I certainly hope you're all doing great. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Jenny and it's very nice to meet you. If you are a return visitor, as always, welcome back. If you haven't done so and you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. Um, I've been, as I told y'all earlier, I've uh, started my Halloween decoration, so I thought I'd share a little bit of it with you. This is just some I've done in my room. Um, today's story is a suggestion. However, for some reason, when I wrote down the victim's name, I failed to write the name of the person who suggested the story. So if it was you, I apologize and just know that I truly appreciate the suggestion. Now let's jump in. Holly Maria Jones was born on the 14th of September in 1992 in Toronto, Canada to Maria Jones and George Stonehouse. Maria was the youngest of four children. She had two older sisters, Shauna and Natasha, and an older brother, James. Holly was close to her parents and her siblings. She was described as lively, gentle, and energetic with a big imagination and even bigger dreams. She aspired to be a famous singer. She took singing lessons as well as guitar lessons, and she loved Britney Spears. She was an athlete who enjoyed playing basketball and running cross-country. She attended the St. Luigi Elementary School in the Junction Triangle, where she excelled. On Mother's Day in 2002, Holly got the gift for her mother ready and gave it to her mother's friend and asked her to hold it as they would all be at her mother Maria's mother's home to celebrate Mother's Day together. The friend left home in a hurry and forgot the gift. The next day, the 12th of May in 2002, the friend dropped the present off with Maria. Maria said the gift was beautifully wrapped with a beautiful card. She decided to wait to open the gift as Holly was still in school. After school, Holly walked home accompanied by her friend Claudia. They would have an afternoon of playing dress up, karaoke, and chess. Maria decided to wait until Holly's friend went home so they could have a private moment together. She placed the gift and the card on the counter. Holly told her parents she was going to walk her friend home at around 6 o'clock p.m. Maria, Holly's mom, said that Holly insisted on walking Claudia home. She said it was kind of raining outside, so she tied up her sweater and told Holly to do her jacket. Holly wanted to change out of her dress-up clothes that were underneath her sweater, but her mom told her that she didn't need to bother as no one would see them. Claudia's home and Holly's home was only a few blocks from each other and Holly knew the route very well as she took it every day to school. She made it to her friend's home, and her friend's neighbor, who was standing on the porch, said she overheard Holly tell her friend goodbye. I will see you later. Claudia's mother offered to drive Holly home, but Holly declined. On the route home, Holly would pass an apartment in a ramshackle Victorian fourplex at 1450 Bloor Street West, where a divorced 35-year-old software developer, Michael Breer, was surfing the internet for child porn. He was born in 1968 in Montreal. He married a woman named Vicki Lee Bulduck in the mid-1990s. Vicki said that Michael was an atheist. She said he was brilliant, but was obsessed with video games and horror movies. She said he was a bodybuilder, and though he was not a huge guy, he was very strong. Vicky blamed herself for not noticing his pedophilia and failing to convert him into being a Christian. Now, I want to add that in no way was Vicky to blame for anything that Michael did, and their marriage only lasted two years, so they were not together at this time. I want to also add that I do not believe being an atheist had anything to do with the horrible acts that he ended up committing. Per Michael, he had become consumed by what he called his dark secret. He said, quote, I always had the fantasy of having relations with a little girl. He said one then appeared. 
He said that he placed his hand on Holly's neck and guided her into the dirty alleyway behind his apartment and then into his apartment. He said that he guided her right into his bedroom and he removed his clothes and hers. He said he tried to S.A. her, but according to him, quote, I never actually completed the act, end quote. Michael Breer admitted that he knew from the time he grabbed Holly that she would never leave his apartment. He said that while walking with her, he realized it was already too late. He said he was already sure he didn't want to get caught. He said within 30 minutes of abducting her, he strangled the life from the terrified little girl. He spent the rest of the night carving Holly into pieces with a handsaw, and he later took several trips to the TTC to throw her body parts into the lake. He said all but her legs. He said he was afraid of going out again and getting caught, so he put her legs into his refrigerator until he could put them out on garbage day. While Holly had walked Claudia home, Maria had went to the store. When she returned home from shopping, it was around 8 p.m., and she noticed Holly hadn't arrived back home. She called Holly's friends and searched the neighborhood, and when she couldn't locate Holly, she called the police and filed a missing persons report. The missing person report prompted a large-scale search the following morning, the 13th of May, and an Amber Alert was issued. They didn't know that by this time, Holly was already deceased. The case shook the heart of the Canadian city, uniting a community and inciting fear among the residents. Citizens wondered how safe their children truly were. Later in the day, the 13th of May, the day after Holly was last seen, a man was walking his dog on Ward Island and he came across a black gym bag. He unzipped the bag and he found a human torso. Six hours after the first bag was found, police found a carry-on suitcase floating in Lake Ontario near the CNE grounds. Inside of the suitcase, they found a five-pound dumbbell, the top of a sponge mop, and more severed body parts. One of those body parts was a head. At this point, they had no doubt the remains were those of Holly Jones. The police released a statement saying, We are no longer searching for Holly Jones. We are now searching for her killer. On the 16th of May in 2002, Police Chief Julian Fantino went to the home of Holly's parents and offered his sympathy. He let them know he would find the killer. Toronto Police Staff Inspector Gary Ellis said the detectives are closing in on the killer because the killer made many mistakes and provided them with a ray of evidence. On the 18th of May, photos of Holly were released to the public in hopes it would trigger someone or something in somebody's memory. On the 20th of May in 2002, Holly was laid to rest at St. Vincent de Paul Roman Catholic Church. Hundreds of mourners were in attendance, including the police and local politicians. Police divers searched the waterfront for evidence, and the police released posters of the two bags and the dumbbells that were recovered from the lake. They asked the public for any information about Holly's disappearance and who could have taken her life. The police hotline received over 1,650 tips and thousands of possible leads. They learned that two men were seen aboard the Toronto Island Ferry around the time Holly's remains were found. One of the men came forward and was cleared as a suspect. The other remains unknown. An autopsy confirmed that Holly had been essayed and strangled. DNA of an adult male was found under a fingernail on Holly's right hand. There were also green fibers found on her remains. The fear in Holly's neighborhood continued and local schools were forced to implement stronger security measures. The high alert in the neighborhood caused an increase of reports of attempted abductions. The sample of DNA that was located under Holly's fingernail was checked against more than 70,000 profiles of convicted offenders and crime scenes in the National DNA Data Bank, but there was no match. The police then canvassed the area and requested hundreds of men in the immediate area to give a voluntary DNA sample. Michael was asked for a sample, and he refused. He said, quote, I feel that it puts the burden on us to prove we're not guilty, That big brother is watching us, end quote. 
While at Michael's residence to request volunteer DNA sample, the police noticed a green bath mat that matched the color of the fibers that were found on Holly's remains. There was also a set of weights that smelled strongly of bleach. This, the weights, and the carpet fibers put Michael Breer as the prime suspect. He was put under constant surveillance. He was spotted throwing a Pepsi can into a recycling container located on Keeley Street. It was retrieved by the police. Later that day, Michael and his then-girlfriend were spotted eating at Kentucky Fried Chicken in the Dufferin Mall. The police also retrieved the cups and the straws when they discarded them. The lab tested the items all night and notified the police it was a match. Investigator Gary Ellis said there was an exchange between him and her, and that exchange was microscopic under her fingernail. That made the difference. On the 20th of June, as Michael was headed to work, he was arrested. He quickly confessed to his crime, and he blamed his enjoyment of watching child pornography and said he was amazed at how easy it was to access this on the internet. He said the more he watched, the more he longed for it in his heart. He said that if when he had walked outside that day, Holly hadn't been right there, he would have just walked the street and gone back home. He said he discarded her remains over a three-day period, the first day being her torso. He said he noticed blood seeping out of the bag and he panicked, so he just dumped it into the Toronto Harbor. The following day, he rode the subway again with a travel bag containing more parts and he dumped them into Lake Ontario. On the third day, he stuffed more remains into a garbage bag and placed them on the curb outside of his apartment with his trash. When Michael went to trial, the attorney for the family, Mr. Danson, read a statement written by Holly's parents, Maria and George, as they were too distraught to read it themselves. The statement said, quote, This cannot be the end. The truth is Holly's spirit, her compassion, her gentleness, her sense of humor, and her love of life will never die. End quote. George, Holly's father, called on legislators to strengthen Canada's child porn laws. He said while some will argue that child porn is constitutionally protected free speech, Parliament must tighten up its child porn laws and have zero tolerance for child porn. Michael was kept in protective custody while he was in jail. He arrived to court wearing a suit, he was clean shaven, and his hair was pulled back. He told Ontario Superior Court Judge David Watt that he decided he would plead guilty. He said he didn't want to put the family through more trauma with the details of what happened to Holly. Judge Watts said, quote, Your crime profoundly shocked this community and city, and it is a community that is no longer easily shocked by crimes of violence. A random abduction on a quiet city street, an essay, an unaliving, a dismemberment, a young active life, like others, full of promise, snuffed out. There seems no bottom in the depravity pool, nor any limits to the vulnerability of our children, end quote. On the 16th of June in 2004, Michael Greer was sentenced to life in prison. In 2028, Michael will become eligible for parole. A petition was created by Lucia Lucia on change.org to keep Michael in jail. The petition now has 5,079 signatures. On top of the signatures, many commented their thoughts on this case. None suggested they would be comfortable or feel safe if he was released. If anyone wishes to sign this petition, please do so. The school that Holly attended created an award, which they call the Holly Jones Spirit Award, and it is given out to fifth grade student every first week of June that best embraces their zest for life. In Sorrowin Park, a mural was painted of Holly. It is located at 41 Wabash Avenue on the side of Addison's Inc. Antique and Reproduction Plumbing Fixtures. Uh, I remember what Holly wore that day that she walked out the front door. I remember her words to me and I remember um, what she looked like. 
in her, in her face when she left. I remember her favorite outfits. I remember what she liked to eat. I remember everything about Holly, and I'm very happy about that because I do have a fear of forgetting. I don't want to forget. To start with Holly's tragedy, what she suffered. She was taken, strangled, she was raped, she was murdered. This is something that you can't, it, it's too difficult to, to grasp, to think about. I do know that you asked the question, how it impacted us. We, we basically just went crazy, all of us. But we did get back together because we knew there was at one point, I don't know when, within all these, in the last 10 years, that we really do need to be with each other. To grieve properly, to grieve so that it isn't as painful by being with each other as a family. We need each other. I feel really blessed for that. I really do feel blessed for, for um, having some pain relieved by, having our, by being together as a family because I have heard of other tragedies where families have separated. And I really couldn't imagine dealing with this tragedy without my family. I need my family. And I believe they need us, me too. The community has helped me get through this actually in a great way, in a, a, a great deal because um, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, it helps me to know that others are out there caring for Holly. It's not just us loving Holly. I feel like I need to know that everybody loves Holly. I don't know what it is, but I, I just need that. And this is what the community gave me. They, they gave me that feeling of uh, caring and for Holly and loving her. Um, most important, I, I don't want Holly forgotten. I don't want her to be nothing. She she's she's very very special to me of course because she's my daughter but because she's gone I want her to be special to everyone you know and my I think of her as an angel but I don't want her to be just my angel I want her to be everybody's angel that's how I feel so you know when I go to the grocery store and somebody uh, approaches me once in a while and says, you're Holly's mother, I just want you to know I think about you. People are afraid to say that to me, but they don't realize that I walk away saying thank you. Thank you for thinking of my daughter. And um, people come out from the community, drop off things for Holly, remembering May 12th, which is the tragedy remembering her birthday, September 14th. All this helps me. Sometimes we don't have to speak to people or we don't have to have contact with somebody, but they, I get a car dropped off or something or a plant and, and it just makes me feel good to know that Holly is not being forgotten. I don't want Holly forgotten, ever. My deepest condolences go out to Maria and George, and that brings us to the end of the tragic story of Holly Maria Jones. And rest easy, Holly. Rest easy, baby girl. You are free. If you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like and subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts on this story or any of my stories. And until the next video, thank you for being here, and toodles. Swindler and honest man who lies I've got a fear of failure The key